Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess. Oh, so something happened. I think we, the recording just starts. Ah, yes, that's right. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so um, we're, we're we're very pleased to have um, Dr. Benoit Falk, um, you know, come give this condensed matter seminar. Um, he um, did his PhD um, in in uh, Leon uh, Brillouin C A Sackley um, uh, on, on high TC um, uh, things. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then after that, you know, he, he moved on to work with a common Benia um, in, in Paris, um, where he, he still is right now. He's still in Paris, um, but he leads his kind of, you know, little team, um, a new team um, on uh, quantum matter in magnetic field um, at uh, the Collège de France. And he will, he'll tell us about all, all sorts of interesting things, but no, he's, he's a very serious experimentalist. Uh, in in uh, high magnetic field transport. So, without any further ado, let's uh, welcome Benoit and you know thank thank you for 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 uh, gracing um, us with your your talk. Thanks. Okay, th thanks a lot, uh, Justin, for the introduction and also to give me uh, the opportunity to present uh, our research. So today I I, I will talk about uh, what's happened to low three dimensional uh, metals three dimensional metals at high magnetic field. Okay. So the motivation of this work is related to a very old question, which is uh, the effect of a large magnetic field on an electron gas system. So when you apply magnetic field, you will learn that electrons will start to orbit on the length scale set by uh, the cyclotonic radius. And as you uh, increase the magnetic field, this length scale will uh, decrease. So there is a regime which is uh, well understood is a regime uh, the semi-classical regime limit, where the cyclotonic radius is comparable with uh, the, the distance between electrons. You observe quantum oscillations, and then the motion of electrons is just described by semi-classical picture. But as you continue to, to increase the magnetic field, at some point, the cyclotonic radius will become uh, very small and can become comparable with uh, the Fermi wavelengths. And here you can expect that the quantum nature of the electrons will affect the dynamic, but also the, the ground state. So this is this quantum limit, and this is the limit that we want to, to explore. So another way to introduce this quantum limit is just to say, uh, to start with a, a, a three-dimensional Fermi C. So you have uh, your Fermi C, your prime magnetic field, you have Lambeau quantification. And at high enough magnetic field, uh, all the carriers will be confined in this lowest Landau level. And what you see in the process is that your Fermi C was a sphere, but at high magnetic field, it will be a tube. And the question that we are asking is, does it change or not the electronic ground state of your system? So, so of course, this is a question that has been discussed a lot in, in two-dimensional electron gas system, where you observe the uh, quantum Hall effect and even the fractional quantum Hall effect when you go to low temperature. But in 3D, this is something which has been less uh, explored. And the reason is that if you take uh, a metal where you have uh, one electron per unit cell, um, the magnetic field that you have to uh, pay to reach this quantum limit is about 10 to 5,000 Tesla. So th there is no way that you can do experiments uh, in, this, uh, in this regime in like silver uh, or copper uh, or, or high density metal. So there is of course one way to uh, overcome this difficulty simply to work with system with larger Fermi wavelengths. That is to say system with low carrier density uh, typically, uh, if you have a density which is five order of magnitude smaller, um, where you have one electron which will be shared by 10,000 or even 100,000 atoms, the quantum limit can be as low as a few Tesla. So therefore, what we, what we want to study is these dilute metals at high magnetic field and see what's happened to their electronic ground state when you go to this uh, quantum limit. So if you, if you are interested by this question, you quickly realize that there is essentially two systems that you can uh, study. The first one are uh, semi-metals, that is to say a system where you have a hole and electron pockets which overlap in the Brillouin zone. And the carrier density is essentially set by this uh, energy overlap here. Essentially when EG, which is overlap energy is going to zero, the carrier density is going to zero. And it turned out that uh, in, in the early days, uh, Mott actually suggests uh, that uh, at very low density, when EG is going to zero, uh, the Coulomb interaction, uh, the Fermi energy will scale with Kf square and the Coulomb interaction will scale with Kf. That is to say that at low enough density, the Coulomb interaction can actually be important in the, in the dilute uh, limit. And then you can have the formation of a helicon holes 
uh, bonds pair, uh, very much like a BCS electron-electron uh, 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 bonds pair in the BCS superconductors, which, which has been dubbed uh, excitonic insulator. So this is the old idea uh, in these semi-metals that at low enough density, they should host or they may host uh, a new type of uh, condensate formed by these excitons. And uh, so, so this is one, one interest to, to this, uh, to, this, uh, to, this uh, to look at these semi-metals. Today, what I will try to show is that actually graphite, uh, which is a semi-metal formed by a hole and electron pocket elongated along the C-axis, if you apply 40 Tesla on top of that, maybe we actually we do realize this uh, excitonic insulator. Uh, here, I just want to mention that in the last year, there is a renewal of interest for the study of semi-metals in the context of uh, topological materials. Many new semi-metals have been identified with uh, non-conventional dispersion. And one thing which, which is, to me, extremely important that you keep in mind is that all these semi-metals are actually uh, extremely good metals in the sense that the mobility of these materials is extremely uh, high which reflect, for example, uh, in the, by their extremely large magneto resistance. So this is here the change of the resistance as a function of magnetic field at low temperature for antimony, bismuth, or w, uh, WTE2. And you see that the change is, like, is extremely large. And this is simply due to the fact that the mobility can be easily reach one million uh, for, for this elemental semi-metal. OK? But so also because they're, uh, they're compensated. Right. Exactly. The so point is that exactly. So here, here, what is extremely important to, 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 to notice is that the number of holes and number of electrons is equal, and this is set by the uh, Fermi surface. It's an intrinsic property. Of course, the, so there is a second class of system that you can consider, which are doped semiconductors. In this case, the metallicity is an extrinsic property is due to the fact that you dope uh, the system. And we are especially interested by system where uh, the metal insulator transition occur at very low doping in order to have a metal and then to explore that, that quantum limit. So, so this metallicity uh, uh, can be protected down to very low density, uh, essentially in system where the bore radius is extremely large. And there is two ways to have a large bore radius. Uh, it's either because you have a light mass. OK, uh, so this is a case, for example, of indium antimony mercure cadmium telluride or zirconium tellurite 5, where the mass is like 0 0.001, for example. And the consequence is that the quantum limit that you can see here as a function of carrier density can be as low as one Tesla. But there is another way, which is to work with system with a large uh, dielectrical constant, okay, which is the case, for example, of STO, which is close to this ferroelectric transition. And, and this is why we are also interested by this system. But here, uh, as, as pointed by uh, Justin, there is a fundamental difference is that here, metallicity comes from dopant. OK, so it's not, it's an extrinsic property. So today, uh, I will uh, essentially try to, to discuss what's happened to these two class of systems, OK, at high magnetic field. And uh, I, I don't know if I will have time to discuss uh, what's happened to doped semiconductors, uh, um, uh, but I, I will start with what happened to semi-metals and especially to the case of, uh, of graphite. So uh, before to start, I would like to thank my colleagues. Uh, this is uh, some measurement that I'm, and, and, and work that I'm doing in close collaboration with Cameron Denia at ESPCI. And most of the measurements that I will show you today have been collected in high magnetic field facilities. Um, so essentially in Grenoble, where there is a DC field, in Toulouse, where there is a pulse field. Um, and we have also a, a close collaboration with Zhang Weizhou in, in, the, in, in Wuhan. And I will also show you some specific measurement, uh, which I found actually part particularly interesting, that we have done in collaboration with Christophe Marcerin and Thierry Klein at uh, Institut Neel in Grenoble. OK, so let's start with uh, the simplest experiment that you can do in high magnetic field facilities. Um, that is to say transport, electrical transport measurement. So here you have a piece of graphite. You put a, a, a current in the, uh, in the layers and the magnetic field is uh, along the C-axis. So what you see here is that you have a large magneto resistance, again, because the mobility is large. On top of that, you observe some small minimum here, which correspond to quantum oscillation. And above this field here, um, you, the holes and the electrons are in the n equals zero on the level. Okay. And what found uh, Tanuma and E, actually this was been done, I think, in the MAG lab at MIT uh, in 80s, 
they found that there is an additional field scale that you can see here, which is the small upturn here. And, of, and the fundamental observation is that in, in contrast with a quantum oscillation, which stick always at the same magnetic field as when you change the temperature here, you see that the onset of this field in your state is going up. Okay, so this was actually just the beginning of the tip. Uh, like 20 years later, uh, Yaguchi and Singleton in Oxford extend this measurement up to 60 Tesla. And you see that actually you have a dome structures which end at about uh, 53 Tesla and which collapse above 10 Kelvin. And this was clearly an indication that something happened in the quantum limit of uh, graphite. Um, oh, sorry, there was a mistake. So, so quickly after this, uh, this discovery, uh, an interpretation came out um, for this uh, field induced state. And this has to do with uh, the peculiarity of the electronic dispersion uh, in the quantum limit So for 3D systems. So when you are in the quantum limit, N equals zero for the dispersion. So the only degree of freedom of your electrons is along the magnetic field. So essentially your system behave like a 1D system. And then you can have a, a two KF processes which give a, a charge density wave, spin density wave or excitonic uh, instability. The reason that in case of graphite, uh, we have different type of instability we can occur along the magnetic field is because we have uh, electron and hole pockets which are Zeeman splitted. So you, you have like 12 nesting possible vectors which can form along the magnetic field. So, so this is why you can have different type of uh, instability. So, so, so just to make a small clarification here, when, when you say the implant resistance, you're talking about stuff going perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? Exactly. So, 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 right. so what I mean is that, that the instability will form along the magnetic field. This is in the Z direction. Z direction. And yeah. you measure in the XY plane. Exactly, yeah. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Right. For the yeah. moment, yeah. So, so the idea is that something dramatic happened along the, the C-axis actually uh, is supported by uh, uh, several observations. So the first one um, uh, is, is the fact that here you have a reentrance, okay? And the way that the reentrance, uh, uh, um, uh, the reason why you have this reentrance is because as you increase the magnetic field, the Zeeman splitting uh, is increasing. And at some point you will depopulate this Landau level. And if you have an instability which involves this electronic instability, of course, the instability will disappear when the Landau level depopulates. So this is one, one argument to suggest that maybe this dome has to do something with this 1D dispersion. But maybe, and to, maybe to answer uh, more precisely to your question, the fact that something dramatic happened along the C-axis come from C-axis resistance themselves. So this was, uh, now, now I'm comparing the in-plane transport measurement with the C-axis resistance measurement. So this is what I just described to you. You have large magnetic resistance, you have the dome, and above, nothing much seems to happen. But what you see is that the C-axis resistance, the story is completely different. You see that here between 30 to 53 Tesla, uh, the, the resistance changed by several order of magnitude. Okay, so, so this is a log scale now. And what was even more surprising is that above uh, 53 Tesla, we find a second window in field where we have this activating behavior. While here, as you can see in the in-plane transport measurement, nothing much seems to happen. And at that time, we have been lucky because there was an upgrade at LNCME to lose. We could extend the measurement up to 80 Tesla, and we clearly showed that actually there was not one dome, but two dome in the C-axis transport. Okay. So, so this was a, a bit surprising and maybe to to illustrate why this was a surprising result. Uh, it, it is interesting to compare what's happened in plane transport, the, what happened in the in-plane transport measurement and along the C-axis transport measurement for the two fields which are here, which are the, the, the essentially the maximum of these two domes. So, so now this is in red, the in-plane transport measurement as a function of the temperature at 47 Tesla. So you see that the resistance is almost constant, but along the C-axis, you have an activating gap. And the same is true at 64 Tesla, where you have an activating gap, but the res in-plane resistance is metallic with this T-linear dependence. And this is a very surprising because in this naive picture, you know, uh, in-plane, the degree of freedom is quenched by the magnetic field because you have the cyclotonic uh, energy. And according to the C-axis transport, you have a gap. So that is to say that anyway, uh, whatever the direction of the current that you send, that you, uh, whatever the, the current direction, you should observe an, uh, uh, an insulating behavior, okay? And this is not what we observe. 
So here it suggests that even though we have a gap system, we still have some in-plane residual metallicity. And this was extremely uh, surprising. This is, so, it's good. So, so just before you move on, so in the Z, uh, sorry, in the C axis resistance, yeah. Um, the gap that you see is this, you know, charge density wave with spin yeah. density wave yeah, exactly. um, yeah. uh, gap. Yeah, but exactly. um, I see, I see. And so, so, so it's, um, but it, um, that, that, that is smaller than the Landau level. It's um, comparable. So, so actually here I put numbers as at 53 Tesla, the G, because G mu B is 8 mEV. Okay, so it is true that G mu B is much smaller than H bar omega C. I think which bear omega C will be like 50 mEV, but but I think due to the, the, the relevant energy scale is G mu B in this uh, in, in, in this problem, and but the gap that we have is about two or three mEV. Uh, so so I the see, gap along the C axis is, is okay. Two or three. So let's say that the smallest gap that we have in the system is along the C axis and is about few mEV. I see, okay. and, and 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 you are. Um... I see. So your in-plane resistance is metallic because you are still inside the Lando level um, somewhere, um, and there's some KZ that is is, is going exactly. on there. But then, but, but your your X Y can move around, but the Z axis, you know, that's gapped out. That, that exactly, exactly. So then, the, so 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 this is why uh, the the presence of this residual metallicity is a bit strange because naively uh, I will conclude that from the C axis transport measurement. Uh, I should have a gap system. So one possibility is, of course, to argue that there is something on the edge of the sample. Uh, so this is one idea. Um, and, but we, the thing is, it's a bit delicate to uh, prove the evidence of some uh, of this edge state. Uh, but the idea will be that you will have some chiral surface state which might contribute to the conductivity. Uh, so this is one idea. Good. Uh, um, so 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 this was really the I think the uh, at least this plot here. Um, was clearly the evidence that something dramatic happened along the C-axis. Okay. There was another important plot, which was the evolution of the onset of the transition. So, so, so now what I'm plotting, uh, I, I'm going a bit fast, but so I'm plotting the evolution of this point here, okay, in temperature. So here you, you see that you have a, a small upturn of your resistance and it's shifting with uh, the magnetic field. And now on these plots, uh, what I'm plotting is a position uh, in function of temperature and B minus one. And this was, uh, uh, as you can see here, you see that it's it, between, let's say, 200 millikelvin to 10 Kelvin. This is almost linear. And this is exactly what you happen, uh, what you expect uh, in this BCS uh, approach, uh, where the density of state will be replaced by the density of state in the quantum limit. So because in the quantum limit, uh, the density of state is changing with magnetic field because you have the density of state is a product of the in-plane density of state. We scale linearly with the field and the C-axis uh, density of state. And when the Fermi energy is far from the bottom of this Landau level, essentially this is constant. And this is why this scale with magnetic field. So this is why we have to plot TC versus B minus one. And you see that it gives actually a pretty good fit and, and actually even give a good uh, estimation of the Fermi energy. And this was important plot because it shows that, that this can be understood somehow in a weak coupling approach uh, where the density of state is just, domin is just controlled by the in-plane degeneracy. And also, and this was a good, uh, in good agreement with the early uh, theory uh, uh, that I, I just uh, discussed. But now you can wonder, okay, what's happened when you go to high field? You know, uh, when you go to when the critical temperature uh, in is the largest. And the first thing that we did is, is now you, I plot the ratio of delta C divided by KBTC, okay, as a function of the magnetic field. So this is again the C axis gap deduced uh, fr from the measurement. And what you say is that at, when at low field you have a weak coupling approach, the so ratio of delta C over KBTC is about 1.7. But when you increase the magnetic field, you see that this ratio is going up and it's saturating. Okay, this is where the TC is uh, the largest. And it's only recently that actually we, 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 we understood the reason of this uh, saturation here. And this comes from the fact that uh, now when you look in the normal state, we find that at this uh, field here in the normal state, we have an additional peak in the, in the Nernst effect, which is a signature of a Landau level depopulation. 
That is to say that now the maximum of Tc, in other words, corresponds to the point where we have this Lando level depopulation. Essentially, we go from a negative gap to a positive gap. Okay. And this is extremely important result because actually this is exactly what we will expect uh, in the MOT picture that we have uh, the, the, this, this excitonic insulator occur when uh, we are, uh, when the, 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 the critical, when, when you delta uh, the overlap energy is going to zero. Okay. And now if you put the numbers on uh, the Bosenstein condensation value that you will expect, putting the mass deduced from the quantum oscillation, you actually find that actually this is eight Kelvin, and this is exactly what we observe. So in other words, what's happened when you increase the magnetic field is that the Fermi energy is shifting to, to the bottom of the Landau level, so Kf is reducing. And at 47 Tesla, Kf is actually zero. So this is where you have the maximum effect of correlation effect. And here, the instability is no, it, it's not described by weak coupling approach, but instead by the strong coupling approach. You have a question? Yeah, I see. No, yeah, so, so, so you, I, I missed this a little bit, but yeah, um, sorry. Uh, this, this is only seen in the extreme quantum limit, right? You're always only in the, yeah, 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 exactly. the yeah. lowest, yeah. lowest, lowest yeah. nano level. And so, so is this one way of basically ruling out all these other um, gap opening mechanisms that you saw from before? Because those were actually the higher Lando levels. Uh, no, no, no. So sorry. So, 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 so all the things that I'm discuss is above seven Tesla, and above seven Tesla, you are in the uh, n equal zero Lando level. Okay. Which is so, which is Zeeman splitted. What I'm just saying is that the nature of this density wave is changing as we increase the magnetic field. It go from a weak coupling to a strong coupling. So, 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 so actually, this density wave is uh, can't be differentiated from this exotonic insulator. So, so are, they, are they related? Are they the same, or how, how do you tell? So, them? so, 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 uh, so this is a good question in the sense that you may argue that here maybe you have a charge density wave at low magnetic field, which become a, 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 an excitonic insulator. This is one possibility. The thing is, we don't have a direct measurement of the nature of the density wave. You know, so this is why it's 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 hard to 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 to, to make any statement on the origin of the density wave. Could, 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 could I ask a naive question then? Yeah. What, what is the difference between the density wave and an exotonic consolidator? Is there no difference or is it? Ah, so, okay. So, is so actually, so this is a very good question in the sense that, um, that the, the, in the charge density wave picture, what will happen is that you, you will have uh, just, for example, one of these. So here you have four Landau levels, okay? So in the charge density wave picture, you just have this Landau level, which will have this, which will have these two KF processes. Okay. Uh -huh. So if you, if you consider, for example, the, so this was the initial model of Fukuyama, where they just consider a, a charge density wave in the zero minus Lando level. They didn't consider what's happened in the other Lando level. Then there was a model where they consider a spin density wave, where in that case, you will couple this Lando level and this Lando level for the whole pocket, but they didn't mention what happened for the electron pocket. Mm -hmm. And again, from our C axis measurement, it's clear that all the Lando level are gaps. So from this point of view, you could say, okay, this is obvious that either, either it's a four charge density wave, like you know, uh, all of this Landau level uh, all uh, will have a charge density wave, or either it's excitonic insulator. But of course, I agree with you that at some point it's a bit of semantic in the sense that um, from 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 experimental point of view, what we see is that we have a, a clear C-axis gap, which suggests that all the Landau level are gap. Now the question is, what is the mechanism? Is it four charge density wave with four different uh, modulation vector, or is it the same, uh, 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 or is it a single uh, excitonic insulator? Is it clear or? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a, I guess what you're saying is it's just a, a matter of degrees, right? It's like, yeah. you know, it's, you know, yeah. you, it's, it's one state over the other state. You can't really yeah. tell the difference in experiment. You, you basically yeah. measure gaps. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. Whether the gaps actually come from one particular mechanism or the other is not so 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 um so clear. But then, if if if, if you're making that claim, then you know how do you then talk about BCS to BC um, transition, right? So you have a little graph that talks about that. And yeah. So so the point is that 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 clearly the ratio of delta C over KBTC suggests that we go from weak coupling to strong coupling linear. Ah, I see. Okay. okay because this ratio go from one point seven to four. The second argument is that now, if we go from a BCS to a BEC language, what you realize is that uh, the TC, the highest TC that we observe, 
So which is eight Kelvin correspond to exactly what you will expect from a BEC transition. Okay, so this is Nanda. So what I'm saying is that in, in the weak coupling limit, I mean, TC should just incre increase, increase, increase. What I'm saying is that the highest value of TC that is rich is actually the value that you will expect for a BEC transition. Mm -hmm. So what I will, I will tend to, uh, I mean, to interpret this, just this observation is that, that here maybe we are not dealing with a BCS transition, but more rather like a BEC transition and maybe excitonic insulator. But I agree with you that, that experimentally, as we are blind to uh, uh, the modulation, uh, uh, we, we, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot, but, is, but, but please keep in mind that it is often the case <laughs> in any type of- yes, no, yeah, 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 I know that, yeah, that's true, yeah. Yes, okay, so, so anyhow, so this was actually just the part on the transport measurement. Um, of course, when we published our paper, there was people who questioned actually the interpretation of um, the, 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 uh, of a gap opening, uh, because since graphite is, a, graphite, sorry, is a layered system, you could also argue that something dramatic happened in the interlayer transport properties rather than a gap opening. And then we say, okay, now we have to prove that we are actually dealing with a, a second order phase transition. So we have to switch to, trans to, to transport measurement to thermodynamic studies. And this is what we, uh, what we have done. So the first measurement that uh, we have uh, actually done is uh, ultrasound measurement. So in this measurement, what you do is that you, 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 you send a sound wave along the C-axis, okay? So parallel to the magnetic field, and you measure the change of the sound velocity, which is in blue here, and you measure also the attenuation of your sound wave. And what we find is that at the onset of the transition, we have a minimum here, which according to the rn first relation, mean that you have a positive jump in your specific heat. And this was the first evidence that actually we are dealing here with a second order phase transition. So this was for us a bit important because it shows that here it's, it's really something for, for us what's important because it shows that you take graphite, which is a very low carrier system. Uh, the mass is extremely light. So coming from correlated material, you will say, okay, there is no correlation here. But actually by adding a big magnetic field, uh, you actually induce this electronic uh, phase transition, uh, uh, and there is actually very few examples of this uh, of this type of field induced states. So then, motivated by this result, we say, okay, now let's try to measure directly the specific heat. And this is what we have done uh, in uh, collaboration with Christophe Marcena and Thierry Klein, where what you see here is the ratio of the uh, electronic specific heat divided by the temperature as a function of the magnetic field. And before to discuss in detail the evolution of this peak here, I just want to attract your attention on two things. The first one is that gamma is 20 microjoule Kelvin minus two mole minus one. So this is three orders of magnitude smaller than in metals, okay? This is four order of magnitude smaller than in heavy fermions, for example. So this is extremely small. This is normal this is because, uh, because the carrier density is very small and the mass of carrier are extremely small. But what you can see is that even though this is extremely small value, so it means that it's difficult to measure, <laughs> but, but you see that at high field, you still have this electronic field in your state. And this was an ex a, a very nice example that how diluteness can be good to enhance the effect of correlation. This is again an idea which is extremely, that people are familiar in cold atoms. But in, in our field of quantum materials system is not, not, really, uh, not really the case. Another thing which was actually pretty interesting is that when you enter, uh, when you are beyond the quantum limit, this is this you here, you see that gamma is changing with the magnetic field. And this increase is actually pretty large, it's about factor five. Okay. And now again, if you compare with some cuprate, for example, this the, the change of gamma factor five is comparable to the change of gamma as you change the doping in cuprates. And again, here it's just a consequence of the fact that as you increase magnetic field, when you're in the quantum limit, the degeneracy is increasing with field. And this is just what the dose, the density of state which is changing with field. And what you see here is that as the dose is increasing, at some point, the dose is so high that you have this electronic density which, 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 uh, which appear. So, so, so this is really an unusual behavior in the sense that this has been never observed before, but which is completely understood by uh, 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 just the effect of the magnetic field on the density of state. And then what was more interesting and more surprising was the evolution of this peak uh, as we change the temperature and the magnetic field, what you can see in this insert here. So as you decrease the temperature, the shift 
the, the peak is shifting to lower critical temperature. This was completely consistent with uh, the transport measurement. But what's more puzzling was the fact that the peak is really changing. You know, you have a nice peak here, and here the, the peak is more like a crossover. Okay, this is even more clear uh, in the previous plot in, in the next plot here, where this is gamma as a function of temperature. Okay, so here you have a nice BCS peak, but as you decrease the temperature, you see that the peak is is really become broader and broader. And this was a, a, a bit uh, puzzling uh, because you, you see here, you change the field just by 30%. So disorder is basically the same, but the shape of the uh, transition is, dram is dramatically affected. So in order to, to understand this, we say, okay, let's try to uh, understand the correction to the BCS behavior. So, so there is essentially two types of correction to the BCS behavior. The first one are Gaussian fluctuation, which correspond to uh, the fluctuation of the order parameter. And it's well known that the correction of delta C uh, of, the, in the, of the specific heat uh, label delta C scale is a power law of uh, tau, where tau is a reduced temperature. And as you can see in this plot, where this is a log of delta C as a function of log the, the reduced temperature, it doesn't work at all. You see here that you have a saturation, while here you should have uh, 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 another uh, 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 line, uh, 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 line like that. So then we have to consider another type of uh, uh, fluctuation, which are critical fluctuations. Here I should mention that uh, instead of this power law, we can fit the data pretty well with uh, empirical uh, fit where it's an exponential decay characterized by a tau zero, and this tau zero characterized as a reduce of temperature where you have this broadening. And what we find, this is a blue point here, what you see is that tau zero is actually diverging as we go to low temperature. So again, it just means that as we decrease the temperature, the transition becomes broader and broader. And from this fit here, you, from this plot here, you could even say that at low enough temperature, you have no more transition because the broadening of the transition is so large that the BCS uh, contribution is almost zero. And so, as I say, this cannot be captured by uh, Gaussian fluctuations, and then we consider critical fluctuations. So the size of the critical uh, regime is given by the Ginzburg criterion, uh, which, which is set by Toji, where Toji is essentially the value of the reduced temperature where the amplitude of your jump in the specific heat is comparable to Kb divided by the volume of coherence. And in case of graphite, we have to distinguish what's happened in the plane and along the C-axis to determine this volume of coherence. What we did as assumption is that we, in the plane, we assume that the only length scale which is relevant is the magnetic length scale because we are in the quantum limit. And along the C-axis, since we know that we have an activation law uh, from the C-axis transport, we plug, uh, we use the BCS coherent length uh, using the gap deduced from the C-axis transport measurement. And if you do so, you find actually an extremely good agreement with the, toji, the, with the behavior of toji and to zero, which suggests that actually we are dealing with uh, actually critical fluctuations. So, oops, sorry. Uh, so now, uh, uh, oops, sorry, it should, it should have been another slide. <laughs> yeah, this is this slide. Oh, uh, so now, so now, uh, the, now what, the way that we understand this, um, this uh, oh, sorry, I went, this is. So now the way that we understand the evolution of this peak is that at relatively high TC, we have a nice BCS behavior plus a tail here, which is most likely critical fluctuation. But as we decrease the critical field, TC is going down, but the BCS contribution becomes smaller and smaller, and your transition is completely dominated by critical fluctuations. And now it's interesting to compare uh, this transition with other transitions. So what we know very well is that in case of uh, BCS superconductor like tin, uh, the critical regime is extremely small. Uh, this is due to the fact that delta C is large, but also because coherent lengths are extremely uh, long because TC is small. Okay, so Toji is about 10 minus 14, and this is why the BCS theory is so powerful. So it's well known also that uh, when you're dealing now with a high TC superconductor like MGB2, for example, uh, what's happened is that TC is larger, HC2 is larger, so the coherent length is, is uh, actually larger. Uh, so the coherent length, sorry, is shorter, which means that Toji becomes smaller. Okay, so for example, even in cuprate, it can reach 0.2, which is extremely large. 
But here, what is interesting in case of graphite and this field induced state is that the value of T0 are, are small, but not super small. The driving parameters for this large critical regime of fluctuation is the fact that delta C is small, as you can see here. And the fact that delta C is small is due to the fact that gamma is extremely small and TC is small. And in fact, I think it's a very interesting result is that not only I show you that, okay, dilute metal at high field can host electronic phase transition, but the nature of this uh, uh, transition will be deeply affected by an extended regime of critical fluctuation, okay? Which is extremely unique uh, when you compare with other uh, electronic uh, phase transition. Can I make a quick, uh, yeah. quick question here? So, so you're talking about these TG parameters. Yeah. Um, there, there, there might also be a similar TG parameter like thing as well um, for a twisted bilayer roofing superconductivity. Okay. Okay. Uh, Maybe is uh, how do, how would that compare? Is that is that this, is is that somewhat similar to um, how strong coupling is? No, okay, so, so actually this is a good question. Oh. Um, uh, um, so here what I'm talking about is the low field, low temperature part where we are in the weak coupling approach. Mm. The strong coupling approach is only when, when we are at high field, when we are close to this uh, depopulation here. I see. I see. So here what I'm saying is that when you go to low temperature, you go to low TC, so your delta C will be, will be actually smaller because gamma is small, but because TC is small also. Um, naively, if I get what I will expect, if I go closer to here, uh, actually this is some, something that we want to do, but it's a bit difficult because we have to do specific heat measurement um, in pulse field, which is a bit uh, complicated. What I will expect is that this here, these things should continue to increase, okay? Uh, because because the because the, del the the amplitude of this jump is related to. The, 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 the fact that we are weak or strong coupling, uh, if we are strong, uh, weak or strong coupling limit. But at some point, I expect that the change should, the, the, the shape of the transition should change because we will get closer to this uh, BEC transition. And this is some, but this is just a speculation. So this is something that we want to, 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 uh, to do. Now, coming back to your question on, on, on bilayer graphene, actually, it's an interesting point. And I didn't try to put numbers actually to see how Toji is uh, in the case of uh, of um, of graphene uh, and, and, and bilayer graphene. Uh, of course, in in, in bilayer graphene, since it's a two D system, um, of course the, the, the fluctuation should be enhanced. I mean, so 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 at the moment, I, I don't know. I don't have a clear answer to your uh, to your question. Okay. No, the, the reason why I asked was. Was um, it just seemed like, um, for example, on the tin and the magnesium diboride yeah. examples, yeah. There, you know, these these um, TG parameters are super super small, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and you might, you might think that these, these 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 systems are very extended systems with the electrons kind of you know very very far out, right? Yeah. Whereas whereas um, if now you think about this graphite system um, mm -hmm. with high magnetic field, the, the first thing whenever you think of high magnetic field is it basically quenches kinetic energy. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and basically tries to make things more localized, yeah. right? And yeah. so you can ask the question: you know, Is this is this the same thing that's kind of happening a little bit into the bilayer graphene, where the more ray instead of magnetic field is being yeah, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. so, so that's that that, that was but the, but but, this, but right? this is, you, I think you're right because what I'm saying is that the fact that delta C is small is simply because the density is small. So as uh, in this graph, uh, so so the density of state will be small. So so but I don't have numbers actually. I don't have numbers. I can just make maybe one comment uh, because actually here we have some people who are doing cold atoms um, and actually they, they study a lot this, this, this type of transition where, um, uh, and, and here, for example, when there is a transition at the uh, unitary limit uh, and actually what is interesting to realize that even the, the density is very small in this system the, because the Fermi temperature is extremely small, it's much smaller than graphite. What's happened is that Toji is relatively high, and the reason is because this is atoms and not electrons. So in other words, uh, actually, the graphite is very I mean, uh, graphite is very special because it's dilute electrons. So then the mass of particles is extremely light in comparison to cold atoms. So I mean, this is just a, a parenthesis, which again highlights why working with electrons is is actually so exciting. <laughs> but um, okay. So, uh, so yeah, I, I just made, made just one additional comment on that things, uh, just to be clear that, that, that you get my message clear is that 
so as I say, we, we go from a BCS to, uh, to, um, to a critical regime uh, of, where, 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 sorry, we go from a BCS transition where down to, to, uh, where, uh, to a regime where the transition is completely dominated by this, this fluctuation. So it's no like a crossover rather than a true transition. And this actually was for us extremely interesting because it explains one observation that, that we, we never understood. So the, and, and it's here. So here you have the resistance as a function of magnetic field for different temperatures. So we go from, uh, oops, sorry, maybe I should put the full screen. Um, it goes from eight Kelvin to basically 40 millikelvin. And what's happened is that what you see is that as you uh, decrease, the, the TC, uh, as you decrease the temperature, so, so, so this is shifting uh, as I show you, but the amplitude of the anomaly is decreasing. And at the lowest temperature, actually, it's even hard to observe any anomaly. Okay, and this for me was, I mean, coming from superconductor, this is uh, completely the opposite of what you will expect. I mean, in any transition, as you go to lower temperature, generally the sh transition becomes sharper and sharper, okay. And here, what you see is that actually the evolution of the, this jump compared to the evolution of the specific heat follow exactly the same trend. That is to say that at low temperature, actually, you, you, you don't have transition, but you, you, do, you don't have a BCS transition, but you are really, you are, you, the transition is replaced by this crossover regime completely dominated by fluctuations. So, so, so this was just my last message on this, uh, on this point. Okay, so this is what I had to tell you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I may, maybe I can stop here actually because uh, 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 or, or, or it's really up to you. Actually, I, I have a few other slides, but um, uh, the other part will be now about uh, dope semiconductors. Well, we have about 15 minutes left. So, okay, so, okay. so just, you know, if you have some slides and you want to kind of show them, that'd be okay, very okay, nice no to hear them. Okay, so, 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 so this was what I had to tell you on uh, on semi-metals, I just discussed the case of uh, graphite, but we also done some work on bismuth. Um, but there is, as I told you in the introduction, another class of system that we can study in the quantum limit is uh, doped uh, semiconductors. Um, and this is what I want to, to, to discuss with you. So there is, so one system which has been studied a lot is uh, the indium antimony. Uh, so this, I'm sorry, I didn't put the reference, but this was work by Shigan uh, in the eighties. Uh, where here you see the resistance, uh, so parallel to the magnetic field and perpendicular to the magnetic field of uh, indium antimony. So the carrier density is extremely small. Quantum limit is one Tesla. So it's about here, it's this peak here. And what you see when you, when you enter in this quantum limit is that you have a metal insulator, uh, uh, which is induced by the magnetic field. And the way that this is understood is uh, 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 like, a, it's a mode transition assisted, assisted by the magnetic field. So essentially, Imagine that you are on the metallic side of your metal insulator transition. So the bore radius is larger than the, dielectric, than the distance between electrons. Now, when you put a magnetic field, what you will do, uh, as, as Justin tell you, that you will decrease uh, the size of the wave function in the plane. So essentially, the bore radius in the plane will decrease. And at some point, you will go on the uh, ins uh, insulator side of your metal insulator transition, just because you reduce the size of your uh, of your uh, of your uh, wave function. Okay. So, so what we have done. So, so this has been studied a lot in in case of indium antimony, but um, as uh, actually there is many other systems to look at. So many systems with different type of uh, Fermi surface and of electronic dispersion of Zeeman energy. So, so there is many things to, to revisit here. And what we did is we just look uh, take the cuisine of, uh, of indium antimony. We took indium arsenide. Okay, so it's a bulk 3D semiconductors, narrow gap semiconductors. You observe beautiful quantum oscillations. The quantum limit is reached at about uh, 4.5 uh, Tesla. And if you do so, what you, you do find a similar uh, phenomena, what you observe is that you have, uh, so now this is a uh, in-plane resist, so this is a resistivity, sorry, perpendicular to the magnetic field. This is a longitudinal resistance and this is a whole carrier density. So you observe this metal insulator transition. You have a drop off in the, in the carrier density. And, uh, and, and what was a bit surprising here um, is that uh, actually the, 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 in contrast to indium antimony is that the drop of carrier density is, is actually very small. Here you just localized maybe uh, 
uh, uh, sorry, the carrier density just drop by by factor ten. While in case of endangerment timony, it's really a complete uh, uh, decrease of your carrier density, like you can reach 10, 12, or 10, 13. So, so the, the metal insulator transition is somehow not, uh, not complete. And wh what we have done is we look at actually the thermal power. Uh, this is maybe for you a curiosity, but we, we used to look uh, at, uh, to study electrical and thermal uh, uh, transport property. And what we find actually, this was the most interesting part of this study is that. We, we, you have here a color map of the resistivity. So you have this metal insulator uh, behavior that you can see very well. But what you can see is that the tr this transition is actually accompanied by a big peak in the Seebeck response. So you see here a nice peak here, which is maximum not at the highest, uh, at the lowest temperature, but at about uh, 10, uh, 10 Kelvin. And uh, this was, uh, again, extremely surprising because if you come from uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 a purely electronic answer, what, what you will expect is something like that. Essentially, when your system becomes activating, uh, so you have a gap, which is delta, your thermal power should be delta divided by KBT. So in the zero, so you expect to have the largest thermal power, uh, not at finite temperature, but in the zero temperature limit. And this is what you observe, for example, in, in PF6. But in case of indium arsenide, this was very surprising because you see that the peak is at finite temperature. And what was even more surprising is uh, the amplitude of this peak. The amplitude of this peak is 10 millivolt Kelvin minus one. So maybe you are not very familiar with uh, thermoelectrical power, but just to give you a few numbers. So if you measure, for example, copper, you will get like one microvolt Kelvin minus one. Actually, this is comparable to uh, what to iron antimony too, which is a system which has attracted a lot of uh, uh, attention for thermoelectrical application, where the amplitude of the peak is about 20 to 40 milliv. So clearly, here we have a huge announcement of uh, the, the, the thermal power across the metal insulator. And, and that's that's just exactly at the metal insulator transition, right? So once you go away from it, it exactly, yeah, it yeah, just, it, it exactly. just goes down. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And, and okay, so to make uh, the story short, uh, what we did is, since it's not at, this is, since it, since it is not a phenomena which occur in the zero temperature limit, you always you, you have to think about phonons, phonon contribution. And, 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 and the best way to prove that this is due to phonon is just you just change the size of your sample. okay because when you are in this range of temperature, your phonons are in quasi-ballistic regime. That is to say that the mean free pass of your phonons is comparable with the size of your sample. And if the signal that you observe is coupled to phonons, the size of your signal should change with the size of your sample. And this is exactly what we, we, uh, we observe here, that we change the width and the, and the thickness of the sample and we, and, and we show. And this, this can be actually understood by the so-called phonon drag effect. And the phonon drag effect is simply that your phonons are in quasi-ballistic regime. Your electrons are a bit are coupled to these phonons, and they are dragged by 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 the, the phonon drag. And what we show actually here to maybe to 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 uh, to to to, uh, to um, what, what we show in these studies is that at the metal insulator transition, the phonon drag is enhanced. Okay, and this was this was actually the main result of this uh, of this topic. Um, here, yeah, I just want to uh, maybe to conclude on that by now comparing uh, indium, and indium arsenide and, and graphite. So what I show you uh, first in graphite that, uh, that uh, we have, um, uh, uh, we have a phase diagram which is pretty anisotrope and which is very different in function of if you look what's happened along the C-axis and in the plane. Um, at low magnetic field in graphite, you have a large magnetoresistivity because the mobility is large. Nothing happens in the C-axis transport because you have no Lorentz force. This is completely normal. Then you enter in this field induced state where you have a succession of these two domes, which are surprisingly accompanied by this uh, metallic behavior. Now, if you come back to the uh, indium arsenide or indium antimony, what we see is that uh, the magnetic field also induces a metal insulator transition somehow, like in the C-axis resistance graphite. But the big difference is that this occurs for any direction of the current injection. And, and, um, and, and also the origin of this, uh, of this uh, 
So the mechanism for this metal insulator transition are completely different. In one case, we believe it's associated with an electronic density which form along the C-axis. Here is more like a consequence of locally of an announcement of localization effect by the magnetic field. And this, I think it's a very good, uh, and this will be my conclusion. I think I hope to convince you that actually uh, there is many physics to uh, explore in this quantum limit. Uh, the nature of the field induced set uh, really depends on the starting point. If you start with a semi-metal or a doped semiconductors, and it depends on the amplitude of the uh, interaction, uh, uh, either electron-electron interaction, electron impurity uh, uh, interaction, and of course, of the amplitude of the kinetic energy. And uh, there is actually many phases which can be induced. And I think we are just at the beginning of the study of this, uh, of this, actually of this, uh, of this phase. Since there is a renewal of interest for 3D materials in the context of topological materials, uh, I, I hope, and at least I will continue to work on this topic to identify new uh, field uh, induced state. So I think I will stop with that and thank you a lot for your uh, attention. Excellent, very good. Um... Uh, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, and I guess you know, um, you know we we should uh, uh, use our uh, um, electronic uh, uh, fat, uh, emoticons, right? In Zoom. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So so yes. Yeah, so so um. So any questions, please. Um, uh, especially students and postdocs. But if if the faculty want to ask questions, that's fine as well. So let me maybe um, just begin a little bit with with a uh, um, with with maybe a, a broader question. Mm -hmm. The very second last slide, you kind of you know try to advance this kind of dichotomy um, between yeah. the um, doped semiconductor in the mm -hmm. arsenide and the kind of yeah. semi-metal graphite. You said, okay, mm -hmm. fine, you know, the high magnetic field, you get very different kind of behavior. One is kind of arising from this kind of charge density wave, and the other is. Um, that's in the graphite case and the other, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of enhancing localization induced phenomena because magnetic field quenches um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kinetic energy. But it seems to me that both of these things at, at the heart of it are, is just the same thing, right? Because um, at the heart of it, when you apply magnetic field, in the graphite case, you create these Lando levels. Mm -hmm. But but that 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 really is 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 one way of expressing the fact that you're quenching your kinetic energy, at least in the XY plane. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I totally agree with that. The, the only difference is that the, the length scale, the energy scale at works are different. In the case of, of, of doped semiconductors, you, you have the electrons uh, ionized impurity energy scale, which, which is extremely important, which is that you can neglect in, in clean semi-metals. And then, and, and, then, and then this is replaced by the electron-electron interaction. So what I'm saying is that at the, I completely agree with you that at the end, all this is just a consequence of uh, uh, Lando quantification. But then the nature of the instability is driven by the dominant uh, 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 um, energy scale, uh, which, 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 which dominates. And what I'm trying to argue is that, of course, in semi-metals and doped semiconductors, there is a fundamental difference because in one case, you have the Fermi surface come from uh, 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 an electronic properties, an intrinsic property in case of semi-metal. So at, at first, you can neglect uh, the problem of ionized impurity, even though it's not completely true. Uh, we can discuss about that. But at first, uh, it's natural to neglect it, at least in a perfect case, in a perfect semi-metal. But in case of ionized of doped semiconductors, you, you cannot uh, elude this problem. You cannot, it's, it's, it's an energy scale which is already present in the system. And, and the question is, is now how, how this different uh, energy scale will behave in presence of magnetic field uh, uh, or not. And, and, um, and, uh, and, and from graphite, to me, it seems that it's more like electron-electron uh, interaction is dominated the, 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 the field in your state. And that in case of doped semiconductors, this is this, um, this is the electron ionized impurity uh, energy scale which dominates. So of course, after you can say, okay, uh, this is a bit of, uh, um, uh, let's say, because there is disorder, even in semi-metal, there is disorder. So that is to say that, that you will be never perfectly compensated. So then you can ask the question about what about these extra carriers that you have in the semi-metals and when you apply high magnetic field. 
And this, actually, I don't have the answer to, this, to these things. Um, um, it's possible that, for example, part of the metallicity that we observe in graphite, uh, it's maybe due to some, to, to these extra carriers, for example, that we have. Um, and this, actually, in graphite is not a big problem. But for example, in topological or veil semi-metal, like uh, tantal arsenic, for example, it's a big problem because we know that the compensation is far to be, to be achieved. Uh, when you look quantum oscillation, you always find some difference between the hole and electrons. Uh, carrier density, we suggest that there is extra carriers, uh, uh, while the band structure calculation will tell you, okay, the system should be compensated. But in fact, in reality, when you do experiment on this disorder system, even though the mobility is large, uh, you have extra carriers. So at the end, it's possible that the physics in certain system will actually meet. Um, uh, Okay, very good. Uh, more questions from other people. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, I would like to ask uh, maybe a very naive question. So here you are talking about uh, very dilute uh, three-dimensional metals and the measure their, uh, their uh, properties under very strong uh, magnetic fields. So uh, to me, it seems that a very dilute metal is very close or on the verge of a uh, uh, an insulator. Yep. And uh, on the other hand, uh, people have uh, found some interesting properties of these uh, uh, magnetic oscillations in two-dimensional insulators, like a tungsten telecoms. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. So I'm asking, maybe this is quite private. Have you tried some uh, to measure some uh, magnetic response of a three-dimensional insulator? So magnetic, okay, so, so, so yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, this, this is true that uh, I didn't talk about that, but we, uh, uh, in one of, for, for one of these scenarios, you have a spin density wave. Okay, yeah. so, so we, we look for, uh, we did some uh, magnetization measurements. Okay, um, to, to, uh, but we didn't, uh, we didn't find any anomaly at the, uh, for, for this transition in the magnetic okay. response. Uh, am, I, uh, am I answer to your question or maybe not? <laughs> I think it's, it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite okay and uh, good for me, I think. Okay, but uh, so, so um, yeah, so, 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 so at the moment, we don't have evidence that these transitions are accompanied by magnetic, uh, magnetic signature. And I think you're, you're right that, of course, there is a lot of activity uh, now for this uh, insulator where people observe some quantum oscillation. And uh, or even in this excitonic like WT2, there is a big, uh, big activity of research. Uh, it is true that uh, for the moment, uh, we, we, in all the anomalies that we observe in the field induced in, in deep in the quantum limit, we, we didn't never, we never observe additional quantum oscillations to make to maybe it's another part to the answer. Actually, um, uh, in case of indium arsenide, to be honest, we look for, uh, okay, so this is maybe just a detail, but, but in indium arsenide, there is something, uh, special is that it's well known that there is a surface state, there is a metallic surface state yeah. on top of the, of, of the bulk. And what's happened is that when you apply magnetic field, actually you, you can essentially kill the contribution of the bulk due to this metal insulator. And then you have this, you just have actually this metallic surface state on top of that. And we believe that we have some evidence for this. This is actually the reason why there is a saturation here because you have this, this contribution of surface state, but <sighs> We never observe a quantum oscillation associated with uh, this, this surface state. I can just mention that Sui actually, uh, actually in, in 90s used indium arsenide to, to, to observe uh, this, this surface state. So, so these surface states are, ex are extremely well known. But again, I, I don't think I, I, I really answer to your question because you have maybe something more exotic in mind. And uh, for the moment, yeah, we don't have evidence for some exotic things uh, like-, like not, not at all, please. Uh, I just want to know more about uh, okay. uh, <laughs> the things that happened in, the, in an experimentalist um, I mind. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So yeah, so, but, but you're right, you're right that, that this is something that we, 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 we spend many a lot of time to, uh, when we prepare the sample is to take care about the surface because uh, of course, as I show you, 
whatever you do, whatever the type of system that you take, which is uh, when, the dilution, when the system is dilute, when you apply magnetic field, you will end by insulator, okay? So then at some point you have to wonder, okay, where my current will go when I will be in the high field regime. And of course, one is edge. Uh, so it can be due to some exotic edge state or, or some just a native uh, surface state. I see, sure. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay, more questions. All right, so um, I think we've come up to the, the end of time already. It's like five or four okay. um, here. Um, um, so with that, um, uh, we, we thank you, um, Benoit, for this very interesting talk. Uh, let me just stop the recording.